Hello, and welcome to day two of the Moss Adams Alternative Investment Virtual Conference. We are pleased that you're able to join us. We have two sessions today totaling two CPE credits. And per the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy, to qualify for these credits, you must attend each session for a minimum of 50 minutes and respond to at least three of the four polling questions in each session. If you meet all requirements, we will send a copy of your certificates via email within the next three weeks. And before we get started, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thank you for viewing our webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls of the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, and now I would like to turn the floor over to Syed Rizvi, partner here at Moss Adams. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to our second day of the Alternative Investment Virtual Conference. I'm very glad you guys are with us. My name is Syed Bithi. I'm an asset management audit partner. And I will be moderating the conference today and the next section. Um, on a side note, if you missed our day one of the conference, you will get a link with a replay later today or uh, tomorrow. So as for today's presentation, you're welcome to ask questions throughout the session. I'll be, mo I'll be monitoring the questions on, on my Q&A window, so feel free to ask, and I will ask our speakers um, as the questions come in, or maybe towards the end of, the, of our first session. If you're unable to respond to any of your questions, we'll definitely take note and get back to you after the conference. Without further ado, I'll dive into the agenda today. We have our, our uh, conferences uh, for the second day is broken into two main uh, sessions. So the first session right after this will be our opportunities and challenges facing private fund investors in, in the current environment, economic environment. So we have our distinguished speakers, Eric Bond, Julie Castro, Abrams, and Joe Zhao. After that, we'll have a 10 minute break at 11, and then we'll go into our text update uh, with Britton, Jason, and Chris. Okay. With that, let's dive into our first uh, topic. Actually, before that, let me uh, do a quick introduction of our panelist. So joining us first is Julie, who is the founder and managing partner of How Women Invest, an early stage venture firm focused on high growth tech enabled women founded enterprises. The firm is a culmination of Julie's lifetime of work propelling women founders to launch and find success with training, capital, and networks. Julie brings her ex extensive experience identifying, supporting early stage entrepreneurs, and have twenty years as a, has been a tw twenty years as a CEO and a, and a board director. Welcome, Julie. Thanks for having me. Joining that. Julie is Eric, who is a co-founder and general partner at Hustle Fund, an early stage venture capital firm based out of San Francisco. Hustle Fund invests in software startups at pre pre-seed and seed stages, backing founder who exhibit great execution and high velocity. Prior to Hustle Fund, Eric was an angel investor and venture partner at 500 Startups. Welcome, Eric. Great to be here. Joining Eric and Julie, we have Joe, who is a general partner in Millennia Capital, a New York-based venture fund focused on high-tech investor, uh, high-tech sector investments across financial services, enterprise, and internet-enabled businesses. Prior to venture capital, he worked in public market as a research analyst, 
an economist at Federal Reserve and the IMF. He earned his MBA from NYU Stern School of Business and is a member of the World Economic Forum. Welcome, Joe. With that, um, we'll go into our first polling question, which will lead into our first topic with our speakers. So Amy, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. So yes, our first polling question is, what macroeconomic factor are you most closely following? A, inflation, B, interest rate, C, recession, D, geopolitical tensions, or E, global trade? And we'll give you a few moments to respond. To respond, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And if you can't see the submit button, just enlarge your slide area. Going to pull the question back up. It looks like it went to the results too soon. I mean, they're all pretty closely tied together. That's a very interesting <laughs> thing about these. We'll do another five seconds here. And just a reminder, you do need to respond to three of the four questions in this session for CPE. All right, here you go. Yeah, Eric, as you mentioned, they're all quite compressed. Um, can't go wrong with any of these. <laughs> uh, I'll kind of open up to our panelists. And, and, and anyone has any comments on the results? Um, I mean, I'm worried about all of them myself personally. Uh, as the purview uh, of someone who's running a pre-seed stage fund, so that's a, a venture capital firm that focuses on really, really early stage investments. One of the things that's really interesting about my world is my peers. Uh, the biggest source of capital, I think, at my stage are actually angel investors. And the, the thing that's happening with all these, these factors that we're citing is that um, I think angel investing is a very emotional kind of thing. It's like when you're feeling wealthy, when you're seeing your net worth increasing on the pu public equities front, especially because so much wealth is held in public equities on the in individual or family basis, then it makes it easier to have like a risk on mindset to say like, yeah, said, no problem. Let me give you like 50,000 bucks uh, to, you know, angel invest in your company. But uh, when, uh, you know, these kinds of uh, uh, these pressures exist and it makes you feel like you have less money. Uh, the risk on mindset starts to disappear. So I think that actually does have secondary effects in terms of the health of early stage investing in my world. So, um, you know, all of these things are, are, are very top of mind for me. Mm -hmm. Can I chime in, Eric, and just say, you said the magic word, which is how you feel. So much of it is, honestly, it might even not have anything to do with the numbers. You're watching the news and you're talking to your friends and you start panicking um, or just feeling less certain. And so you pull back and it may not have anything to do with real numbers, actually. Um, so it could, but it doesn't always. It's, it's an emotional thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could, let me just jump in. So for me, it's inflation. Uh, I'm going to just put on my former economist hat. Um, so the w inflation is sort of the root of all evils as we are, as we speak, because there's high inflation. That's why the Fed has to aggressively jack up rates to now four to five percent. That's why rates are high. And because rates are high, that's why it's causing a recession. So the, 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 the easiest analogy to think about it is, OK, let's imagine this child is, is, is sick. Well, why is he sick? Well, he's got a fever. Okay, why does he have a fever? He has a fever because there's an infection, let's say somewhere in the, uh, you know, whatever. So, but so in this analogy, the patient, uh, the doctor is the Fed. The patient is sort of the, the market and the economy. So all of a sudden, the child can't do anything because he's sick. Well, why is it the root of the issue is there's an infection? So for the fever to go away, while well, the doctor is going to inject antibiotics. Uh, to basically kill the infection because when the infection goes away, the fever goes away. So that's sort of why, for me, the number one thing is inflation, is as inflation recedes, the Fed is also going to back off from raising rates. And then when the mm -hmm. Fed uh, backs off from raising rates, um, then then sort of the recess recessionary fears will sort of, rece recessionary risks will sort of um, decline. Um, so if you, so if, if you think about sort of what happened in the last business cycle, is is um, in the uh, decade from the 2010 to 2021, we had a decade of ultra low inflation because tech because because 
because uh, we came out of the 08 09 financial crisis and um, uh, the banking sector imploded. So we had to fix that the whole economic machine. And then uh, global trade was at all time highs. There was no uh, trade war tensions. Supply chain wasn't the issue. Um, and um, in that sort of business cycle, um, we had low inflation because tech also became a big part of uh, everybody's lives. And tech, by definition, is defl- disinflationary because tech brings in efficiency cuts costs. So for the last decade, we had low inflation. So the Fed was able to keep rates at basically zero to two percent because because rates were low. In that allocators were able to allocate more capital into public and private equities. Then what happened is we had COVID in 21 and 2000, 2020, 21, 22. Once COVID came out, we had all these supply chain issues. Now it's like supply is down, so demand is up, price are high. Uh, people can't find, uh, well, people, there's a lot of jobs. Um, people aren't willing to come back to the labor force because, because everybody's working from home and nobody wants to come back to work. Everybody got money from the government. So uh, there's a shrinkage of labor shortage uh, and there's a lot of job openings. That means wages go up. Um, and so there's a lot of that, and there's the war in Russia that's like oil prices went up. So you had high inflation. So inflation went up all the way up to 9% uh, for the CPI. And that's why, the, uh, and the core inflation, which is basically inflation minus um, sort of like food and et cetera, went up as, as, as high as six, five to six percent, basically going from zero to one to like six percent. So the Fed mm-hmm. has to, the Fed policy rate has to match inflation. So then the Fed basically in March began raising rates from zero to basically now four percent, and it's going to end up at probably five percent or higher, maybe even higher. So with high inflation, high rates, now we're going to go into a recession. So now, when does all of this sort of thing end? Well, let's go back. What's the root cause? The root cause is is is, is inflation. So that's mm-hmm. why for me, when inflation recedes, and by the way, inflation has already sort of shown signs of receding. The last three months, of inflation rate has been has been climbing month, month over month. CPIs came down to seven point seven percent from the peak of nine point one percent or something like that. So I think we're we're in this process where inflation is already coming down, and the Fed's already said, you know, we're we're also going to slow down. So. There's, you know, I think there's, um, we're seeing the, the, the lights at the, end of the, at the end of the tunnel that hopefully inflation is already beginning to, 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 to improve. And what that means is the Fed's also going to be able to back up a little bit. And hopefully, uh, you know, we, we're probably going to be in a recession, most likely. Uh, but hopefully the recession won't be a severe recession. It's going to be more of a mild recession. You know, Joe, if you, I'm not an economist, so you're going to need to correct me if I'm, uh, if, if my read on this is incorrect. But we go through these cycles regularly. If you, you know, if you look at the historical numbers, and the most these downturns are is about eighteen months. And people may or may not realize we're literally in the third quarter of this. Um, uh, you know, based on the 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 Fed's numbers, right? So, in concept, you know, by June, maybe by September, we should really be coming out of this. So, I think for for a lot of this, us, you got to have a long term view on it. And in venture, it's such an interesting thing, right? Like. It depends on who you are in venture, right? But for those of us like me, where I'm constantly raising money and you know got a new, a new fund coming uh, really relatively quickly because I'm I'm pretty small, I have I'm I'm looking at the raising and I'm looking at the investing and then I'm looking at the supporting those companies over time that are having the experience of the inflationary environment, right? Um, and so um, it's harder to raise money in this environment, both because of what Eric said about individuals, but also institutions. They're looking at their total portfolio. Let's you know, you know, let's say that they've allocated ten percent of their portfolio to this asset class. Um, if your portfolio is smaller because the markets are downturn, all this, and especially if you're you know, which ours is, our, you know, a lot of venture funds are doing better than the market significantly, right? Um, you know, you, you are now over allocated in venture. So even if they're just doing that math, that can become a, a const- that can constrict the capital. And furthermore, um, they'll say, we're just going to keep investing in the funds that we've already invested in um, and not really taking on new investments. And so just on, you know, on, on our, uh, from our landscape, it's both, it's both that. And then it's also, you know, um, Market corrections that can actually be really great for valuations. We had a big problem where last year and the year before, well, it was both a problem and it was good for us because we sold a couple companies at really high valuations. Um, uh, but we had this environment where it was like, are you kidding? How could you possibly justify that with that much revenue that you think that your, you know, that your company's valued at that 
ridiculous amount. Um, uh, so it's a good correction in some ways on that end as well. So it, mm. it's, it, you know, that's how these markets work, right? Sometimes the corrections are are appropriate. And right now we had all these layoffs. So you were talking about the pressure with the jobs. All of a sudden we have a flood of people in California because everybody got laid off last two weeks um, uh, that, that, that now are looking for jobs and that's going to hopefully put some down pressure on the at least the salaries. Yeah, Julie, Julie, I just want to stay on that um, topic of layoffs. You know, obviously nobody likes to talk about it, but a lot of us being in Silicon Valley in the Bay Area, we, we are disproportionately impacted uh, in, in our you know, where we live. So with, with Meta, Twitter, Salesforce, you name it, I, every, everyone's is following each other. Um, what's yeah. your, how concerned are you in terms of just tech? And do you think is this going to be remain concentrated in tech or you think it will have an impact outside of tech? Uh, I think it, I think it might have some impact. All right. But this is the thing, you guys, some companies lay people off because they needed to lay them off and they were in trouble. And you just said something that was really interesting, which is they're fo- I have a bunch of friends that are in the C-suite. It's a major, major tech institutions. They're like, oh, this is a great chance for us to let go of the low performers. So they're taking, they don't need to. They're taking advantage of this to slice off the problem children. And it's, um, you, you know, even if you look at the cause of this inflation, you know, we're having record, record profits at a whole bunch of companies and they're not lowering their rates, they're increasing them and they're pretending like it's because of inflation and the truth is it's they're having record profits. So, you know, uh, we, get, we all get caught up in taking advantage of the, the macroeconomic environment and sometimes um, misleading people about what the true reason is for some of the actions that we take. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, Eric, <laughs> anything to add to that? Um, well, well, I guess like when I think about, uh, I'm kind of like processing two things right now, uh, uh, Joe's statement as well as Julie. So on like the, I'm not an economist either. I just want to touch on that though, uh, on the inflation stuff is I also like think about like other black swans that might happen. So if like China's easing COVID restrictions right now, and then there's a massive collapse of the healthcare system because they can't really support mass infections. What is that going to do supply chain? You know, does that constrain and create inflationary pr- pressure as well? Um, <clears throat> that's that's sort of one thing. I think the, uh, yeah. So and also just like you know the geopolitical stuff. So this is why like that that survey is so interesting. Is if there actually is like some sort of shock in like the oil market <laughs> that makes everything much more expensive to ship. That that also creates some inflationary pressure. So we have some good levers to control inflation on the on the Fed side, but like uh, there are those things too. And it's always like a a wonderful little, maybe not wonderful, but just like a, a kind of a crazy little roller coaster that uh, that we get to experience and, and seeing how that's going to affect um, our markets here. But uh, with regard to like the layoffs too, you know, um, having gone through like dot com 1.0 and then the Web 2 collapse and then Great Recession and then now this, like this, this feels like as a jaded guy, like a, a much more low key recession, <laughs> uh, like in in my very horrible history of reading uh, like economic history like this is kind of closer to 1967 for one to understand when there is a uh, a recession does tipped by inflation and then like two years or something like that or 18 months so um i i'm kind of going into this like yeah it's, it'll, it'll be okay um a bull run eventually will will happen again and when i see mm-hmm. things like the layoffs um while I don't actually want to discount the stress that these people and families are, are going through, that's awful, especially if you're in the H-1B visa and you feel the pressure that you might actually be deported within 60 days if you can't find another job, that's actually really awful. I also see the the glass half full side, which is just like, are these people going to start companies? Do they need some funding to get going? Could this be one of those moments where you know we can invest in, and work together while the bottom's happening and then when the bull market inevitably does happen, well, the next generation of great businesses form. And right. that's what I get excited about. Uh, but it is a privilege to sit on a little bit of powder um, on this panel to, to do that. And, and not everyone's in that position, but um, at the same time, I'm like, this is our moment. <laughs> it is. That's where the biggest, you know, Airbnb started in a downturn, right? It's a big one. Yeah, well, as a, I didn't, I didn't even, I never even thought of contemplating that aspect. Um, uh, so, Joe, same, same question to you, but on the layoffs, it seems that you've been in agreement with the rest of the panelists here. Um, any, any other thoughts to add? Um, yeah, look, it's um, 
I mean, there's different perspectives. I mean, from the perspective of the employees and their families, obviously, very, um, very um, stressful. And then I, and uh, it's, you know, I hope you know people will find solutions, etc. Complicated by the immigration policies. From the perspectives of founders, I think, you know, um, they have to do what they have to do to keep the companies in business, and what that means is reduce cash burn to uh, to uh, uh, extend cash runway. Given the capital market for late stage venture growth equity has been very weak this year, and it'll probably last till next year, uh, thanks to all these macroeconomic headwinds. And then from the perspective of uh, investors, uh, you know, I think we uh, to to quote uh, people that you know I, you read on the news and you learn from. Let me learn. when there's blood out on the streets is when you should be greedy. And, and so, as, right. as investment firms with a lot of guard power, we're asked to capital. And now's a great time to invest. And to Julie's um, point, and, uh, yeah. Uh, Joe, sticking with you, uh, with you, a question came up um, in a Q and A session. Uh, do you think the Fed will be able to hit their two percent inflation rate no. by twenty twenty three, twenty twenty four? No, absolutely no way. Okay. Um, no, because 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 so I think how do I put it? I don't want to go too off topic, um, but right now the core inflation, which is the number that the Fed really targets, is is is, is right now sitting at five percent. Um, it, it, and that number has, has been declining. It's going to be hard for it to go back to 2%, which was where it was in the last business cycle, the last 10 years. Uh, it might end up somewhere maybe in the 3%. Um, and, and that's just because there are a lot of structural uh, changes in the economy that's uh, occurred differently post-COVID than before. Uh, one is uh, there's permanent work from home, people want to work, work from home, the labor market is more competitive, competitive. supply chain is not going to go back to what it was because there's also US China are kind of doing this breakup. So you have to rewire the, the supply chain. Um, so like inflation won't go back to probably won't go back to 2% for a while. So that's right. why like, you know, actually, like I was talking to our, um, like our, you know, internal our interviews, like this upcoming decade, this upcoming bull market after this maybe recession ends in 23 or 24 is going to look a little bit differently than the last 10 years. But and I, I don't want to go too much off topic, but, but the answer is uh, the Fed's trying to get the inflation back to to 2%, two, but that may be hard. It might go up to go down to 3%, but I think going back to 2% percent where is where we average in the last 10 years will be more challenging than people think because of all those structural issues that have really changed post-pandemic. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was, it'd, it'd be hard to manage this, runaway inflation uh, in that short of a period. Uh, so, Julie, I, I want to wrap up the conversation on the economic outlook. Uh, I'll start with you, Julie, just to wrap this conversation. The sense I'm getting, we're, we should not be too worried, um, but I, I just do want to get your... No, it depends on who you are and where yeah, you're exactly. at. So I mean, like, that's, and... unfortunately, it's all the depends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is normal stuff. If, you are, if you've lived long enough, I'm older than I think most of you guys. Um, you know, you you anticipate, you know, you have perspective, you can step back and you plan for it. Um, and so you have some reserves. Um, I actually always think like you were talking about, you know, the, the founders buckling. Sometimes when a, a founder has to buckle down, you actually see them innovate and get more capital efficient in ways that they that aren't terrible in the long run. It, you don't want anyone to have to go through discomfort and pain, but there there's, there's always there's always innovation that happens in these moments, and I guess I would just say, um, you know, valuation correction, uh, the innovation we can see, um, like Eric said, you know, hey, listen, like start it now, and I'll help you behind the scenes or give you some a little bit of cash. Let's get you going so that we're ready to go when the market really uh, seems a little more flush. The other thing I will just say as a VC, and I talked to a bunch of other uh, VCs on a regular basis on a committee that I have. It's kind of interesting. I actually am not seeing the explosion, Eric, yet. Maybe it starts now because people have had a little bit of time to get those companies going. But I feel like I'm seeing the same deal over and over. And over. The same company, the same mental health solution, the same. Like, I don't know. I'm like, come on, guys, give me some, give me something. So we've actually um, I did less investments in the last six months than I did in the previous couple of years. Not because I don't have cash because I do. I have dry powder, but I haven't been seeing quite the deals that I want to see. Um, and valuations are just I would say just in the last two months, they're really starting to be correcting. It's just, you know, some, some of these things take a minute. Uh, people were still hoping. And in fact, we had a company that sold in, in May at 
I thought a multiple that was quite beyond what I would have thought would have made sense, but thank goodness, because I made money. For, and <laughs> so, um, so anyway, it, it's interesting times, some yeah. delayed reactions in the market. Eric, same question to you. Just wrap up your thoughts on uh, you see opportunity, obviously, but I also want to bring a perspective from the main street also, right? We, we sometimes do tend to live in a little bit of a, our own isolated bubble here. Uh, but yeah, just, just general, doesn't, doesn't seem like you're looking at half glass full uh, challenges ahead, but just, just your, if you have to conclude uh, what's upcoming next year, yeah. and maybe a year later. You know, if you're going to be doing angel investing or pre-seed or seed stage investing, there's only one really important question that you're asking yourself when you're talking to these founders, which is what happens if things go right? You know, like it's a very optimist driven uh, asset class and the participants there also have to be dreamers and optimists. You know, um, just so speaking as someone that's managing a fund, um, every fund that we create has a 10 year life. So my view of that is you need to develop a strategy and accept the fact that you're pricing in recession. Now, our bull run from the Great Recession to where it ended around now was unusually long. I actually studied like the length of the recession, and it was like like one of the longest bull runs in the history of since we've started to measure this stuff. So it was unusual. I don't think we're going to have like 14-year bull runs as the norm, um, but you know we should be doing these recessions every seven to ten years, it seems. So mm -hmm. yeah, bad times happen, good times happen, but. The advice I have, which is very hand wavy, at least to the founders, and this may not be answering your question, say it is like, um, keep your head down, <laughs> keep building, keep shipping, try to build a great going concern. And <clears throat> it might get rocky at certain points, but it always is rocky. And then, you know, um, a great business hopefully will have a path to become, becoming a great going concern and multiple paths towards survival in the future, whether it's from investors uh, injecting more capital, debt, or other kinds of mechanisms as well to to be properly funded. So uh, it's a little bit of a hope and faith kind of mentality, but I actually hold to it. And I think it actually kind of works in Silicon Valley. Uh, I like that eternal um, optimism in you. Uh, Eric, uh, Joe, uh, wrap up this conversation on this topic. Outlook for you. Um, yeah, you know, to everybody's point, um, you know, the way that like the markets and the economies have evolved. I mean, I guess the way with, I guess, life in general is you you take a couple steps forward you take a step back and you raise like a child you get you grow you get sick and you grow like it's like me and them. like my car my career is always there's ups and downs so you just have to uh, uh i think the last couple of years the party got a little crazy and right now where we are is everybody's kind of drunk and puking so nobody's partying anymore but you gotta let people wake up sleep get breakfast and you no know, maybe in the next few years we'll go back to the party again so um so so that's sort of my view is like it's out there is not pretty in venture. Um, uh, it's even uglier in, in crypto, uh, but it's a boom and bust cycle and you just have to work through the ups and downs. And you know, if you're a founder, you gotta, um, I think if you're a founder, you have to uh, leverage your VCs to really get a sense of what's going on in the market. Because founders are by definition looking down to execute, VCs were looking at the market and macro. Um, and as VCs, we have to um, just, uh, you know, also be just be, be optimistic, right? Um, so, mm -hmm. so yeah. I and, just think we need to have a video clip of this economist metaphor, the the barfing the night the morning after. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I like that. Uh, and and uh, Joe, before I let you go, one more question. More of a again, a Fred question came in, and someone's looking kind of far down. And you expect the first cut to happen, rate cut to happen, and not till twenty four, not not till twenty four later. Okay. I think I, I, th I think if you watch Bloomberg, you watch TMBT, you watch, and I've gone onto some of those like Alice, and um, and I've been asked the same thing. Uh, this, the 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 investment banks and then the hedge funds want a rate cut, um, mm -hmm. but I don't think the Fed's going to give it to them. And they said why? Basically, the, the 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 quickest, the easy, I think the easiest way to think about the analogy is. And they said it, but they, they, they haven't said it in a way that I think most people understand is imagine you're a doctor and you're treating a patient with like that, that analogy with like an infection rate. You want to keep giving the antibiotics for longer periods to make sure the germs don't come back. Because in a reinfection, it gets worse. 
And so that's what the Fed is saying here is inflation is like the infection, if you want to analogy that way. And just because inflation has gone down doesn't mean it's going to stay down. It can come back. So the Fed rather keeps the rate high. They're going to raise the rates to a terminal rate, which is basically the, the peak of the rate for the cycle. And they want to keep it for longer. They'd rather go harder and longer to make sure inflation not only comes down, but stays down. And then it wants to see evidence that inflation has no chance of coming back. Because if the Fed cuts too easy and inflation goes back, then the Fed's going to have to uh, raise again. And at that time, it's going to be even worse for the market and worse for the economy. So that's why the Fed said this like very explicitly. And, and I, th- I don't think people really pick up on it. It's like they're going, they rather, they think the risk of letting go too early outweighs the risk of tightening too much. So what okay. that means is they rather tie harder and longer to make sure inflation really is killed before they would sort of um, uh, ease. So what that what that means is twenty. I don't I don't think in twenty three they're going to cut. They're probably going to uh, keep keep the rates elevated and just let it stay flat, like let's say four four point seven four or five percent, and let it let it run through twenty twenty four and see kind of where things go. Uh, but I think on top of that, this is a, I, I think we're getting a little bit complicated here in, here in terms of you know, the financials. They're also doing QT. Basically, QT is the opposite of QE, which is they are going to, they, they're going to raise the rates to a terminal rate, which is the, the ceiling, keep it to keep financial conditions tight, which means it's going to discourage like risk on investing like public equities, private equity, venture capital. And to tighten further, they're going to do QT, which is basically withdrawing more money away from the financial system. Right now, their balance sheet is sitting at $9 trillion. And they're removing, I think, I forget how many, $50 billion a month or something. So they're going to speed up or just keep doing QT to remove more money from the financial system. So that's another way they're going to tighten. So so to answer the question, like I don't I don't see the Fed cutting rates till probably 24 or, or, or later for all those reasons. Okay. So we should we should buckle down no more no financing until <laughs> well well and so then there's you know there's there's risks and opportunities right so as you see like you know the Fed funds rate is already at four percent going up to five percent real estate what a thirty year mortgage right now is sitting at what eight percent the mortgage market has all yeah. been stopped um, but 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 in private credit um, if you do like LIBOR or CIFOR or whatever call that plus the spread private credit funds are are making twelve ten to twelve percent really well. But at the same time, there's like the, the default in the private credit markets is going up. You're seeing Blackstone's fund just like, you know, past redemptions. So like, so there's risk and opportunities. Like if you can, you can park your cash now in a CD account, risk-free, getting 5%, 4%. Uh, and, and the S&P is actually down 20% this year. So there's risk and opportunities if, if you're an allocator. Um, and I think that, um, so for right now, I think the losers is venture capital. Uh, the winners is like, you know, government bonds, CDs. But you know these things change. So so, but right now um, there's risks and opportunities. Cool. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm going to move on to our next polling question to lead into our next topic. Amy, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you. So the second polling question is: Which public equity market sector do you most expect to outperform in 2023? A. Technology. B. Healthcare. C. Financial services. D. Energy. Or E. Other. And for those of you not seeing the polling questions, they're located right on the slide. So please make sure you have that window open. Uh, you can always click the icon at the bottom of your screen to verify it says slides. And you can also try hitting F5 to refresh. Yeah, while we're looking at the polling question, I, I do want to knock out one another question came in. Uh, and it's open to any panelists. It's more uh, a commentary on Warren Buffett's recent statement saying S&P index passive index will beat the collection of active hedge funds i know we are most of us are venture capitalists here but just just curious if anyone has any thoughts on on warren buffett's comment of s p index beating active hedge funds or no comments this like <laughs> i mean isn't isn't that like his whole MO, regardless of the economy, is just like if you're a retail investor, you're always better off putting in the ETF or index fund. And um, I think there's pretty good supporting evidence of that. I mean, <clears throat> the I'll, I'll this is kind of what I've been thinking about with this current recession is just like, man, everything looks so cheap, 
right? Like, um, not to sway the the poll here, but like I'm looking very closely at like the public comps of uh, or the valuations of tech companies in particular, right? Coinbase is down like 90%. <laughs> and like like all these other companies are like down like 80, 90, 95%. Um, uh, maybe that is alarming, but if, if uh, like longitudinally in the long term, like does that mean that like that's actually where the best return could be if you can index at least some portion of a sector that you're bullish on? Of course, like we love tech on this panel, uh, so we're very biased. Um, I would actually even argue like uh, when this I tell my friends is like maybe maybe the opportunity is not trying to get angel checks in or trying to sneak into private equity, but just like freaking buy stuff on the public markets. Because you know that that seems to be a much more safe perspective <laughs> on seeing high growth. If you're willing to to wait like a couple of years or ten years uh, to to see the outcomes for that, and those those could be even better than the DPI or other kinds of like cash on cash returns you see in investing in a VC fund, even arguably, yeah, but with liquidity it. along the way, you could sell along the way too. So I'm not trying to like dissuade you to invest in uh, <laughs> Julie Joe or, or my funds because I think they're all excellent. <laughs> but like uh, you know that that's also just um, uh, an opportunity that seems unusual in these kinds of bottom markets if you have powder to, to put it in. And that's a big F. I, I would just say, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to avoid being too much of a futurist in, in, in any of this because I think, I, you know, like Eric says, you know, there's ups and in, in, both Eric and Joe said there's ups and downs and, and, and it's about, you know, can you, can you be patient? Um, but uh, energy was one of the uh, strong performers here and healthcare. Um, you know, there's huge uh, resources in the climate public bills. Um, and, you know, climate tech is really uh, getting a lot of fuel. Um, and to me, uh, you know, the people who invested in climate tech in the last 10 years, thank you. Um, uh, that said, now everybody gets it. Everybody believes it. It's ubiquitous. It's something that we're all, I, I don't think, you know, it's the climate deniers seem to, I don't hear them anymore, right? Um, uh, so I actually think this is a pretty important moment for all of us to buckle down on, on climate solutions um, because, I, you know, I think they're, I don't know if you listen to the, you know, CEO BlackRock, you know, Larry Fink, you know, tried to suggest that all the next unicorns are going to be climate uh, related companies. Um, uh, but, but, but we're doubling down on climate for sure. Mm, interesting. So Julia, I, I want to stay with you on, on uh, I know we briefly touched upon the impact of, uh, you know, on valuation and um, obviously things that are looking, you know, for as an investor, just, just generally, you you know, a lot of us are sitting on a lot of dry powder. Are you kind of, for lack of a better word, are you looking to say, oh, this is really good in terms of, uh, it, has the pendulum shifted in your favor now in terms of you going out and, you know, negotiating really good rounds and term sheets with your- Well, uh, yes for or... new investments. Yes for new investments. And for current investments, sometimes some of them are, are having a harder time uh, 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 and, and needing another infusion of cash. When we can, we are negotiating to drag along some of our previous um, uh, terms uh, or investments into new terms uh, that might be better for us. So um, it it kind of depends, but uh, you know, um, I see real real opportunity here for us. Mm -hmm. Interesting, uh, Eric. Same question to you. I, I know you just launched a new fund and are, you know, obviously you have your current portfolio as Julie mentioned, but with all the dry powder you have committed to you, um, are, are you excited to see what the yeah. valuation is for you? <laughs> I mean, where are you starting to see it? Like, so an interesting kind of nuance when it comes to private equity or early stage venture is you tend to see the valuation uh, dips in the later stages. So like, let's call it series B and beyond, like you're going to feel it much more acutely. So a deal that could have been done at a $200 million post money valuation at a series B, maybe that goes down in half or even low, lower than that. But uh, the the frustrating thing, maybe, is that a pre-seed and seed, it's like the last category that tends to feel the effects of uh, the drop. So <clears throat> earlier this year, as valuations we were noticing were, were remarkably dropping starting around like April, uh, at the growth stages, and we're like, okay, this thing is going to come. It's going to be like six months or so, and it's finally here. So, pre seed valuations for us has dropped, um, not precipitously, but it's going to. It is like a slow rolling falling knife, if that's a concept. <laughs> um, but um, I also do think it's a return to sanity. So, uh, in the 
last two years, uh, before all this stuff was starting to happen, uh, valuations were going a little bit crazy. And I think there was less diligence. Yes, there was yes. definitely <laughs> less discipline also in terms of thinking about the long-term con construction of, or I guess like perspective of what happens if you raise at too high of a valuation. And we're kind of now back to pre-pandemic levels is what I'm kind of noticing. And it might go down a little bit further, but uh, the pace of deals is slowing in the right way. But it's not like slowing like horrendously where it's like we can spend like six months to do a deal. Like that's very rare. So it, it just feels like a return to sanity. It, it was uh, almost like a mania that we had experienced for two years. And then now we're kind of coming back down to earth. So I, I love it. Uh, I, I mean, I personally love it. And I actually do think it's good for founders too, because it's, it's actually detrimental to be in a market where you can raise at extremely high valuation for very little progress on your business. That's actually ingesting a poison pill that makes it more difficult for you to raise in later stages when markets are a little bit different. So I, I just largely think it's great for everyone. Hmm. Do, do I see you in agreement and smiling? Is, is that, yeah, I mean, cause I do a lot of growth stage investing and growth has been, that's made it's like some of the valuations are really, really down. So it's, um, you know, there's a lot of blood on the streets in growth equity on late stage venture. Um, uh -huh. you, know, you know, late stage venture, early stage public or growth equity. There's a lot of um, down rounds, flat rounds, um, um, secondaries that are like off their last rounds and uh, by a lot. So there's a lot of um, valuations that become a lot more attractive. Uh, but I kind of want to go back to um, finance fundamental one on one, which is why are valuations down? Evaluation, I mean, the price of a stock or the price of a company is basically the present value of all future cash flow discounted to the present. So basically, it's a it's, it's a it's a it's a simple math equation, right? Price equals future cash divided by the discount rate. Well, the discount rate is basically the the Fed policy rate plus like some sort of um, numbers in it. So before you have let's say, let's use use the math, you had a hundred dollars of future cash flow divided by basically one of the let's say it's called the discount rate. You get a present value of one hundred dollars. Well, now that rate, because inflation has gone up to like five, then the present by by math, a hundred dollars divided by five is twenty dollars. That means your the stock of the, uh, the the price of the stock or the price of the company has gone from one hundred dollars to twenty dollars. So, so that's why mathematically, like values are down not only in the stock market but also in um, uh, late stage venture. Um, and mm -hmm. so, and so the question is, okay, well, I you know. So like the valuations of Robinhood in the stock market, Palantir, like they're not unreasonable given where the, 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 the discount rates are. But the question you have to ask is like, um, uh, is rates gonna stay elevated forever? No, right? Because rates are high this year and next year because of inflation, but we know where inflation is going. So if, if inflation is gonna come down in the next two to three years, that means discount rates are gonna come down in the next two to three years. That means the valuations of these companies and stocks will rebound uh, violently in the, in the next two to three years. So that's one. And then you add the organic growth of those of the growth rates of these companies, the growth rates in the top line, the gross profit in the bottom line. Like that's how we make money as investors: is you you uh, you you leverage macro, but you really look for companies that can grow organically. Uh, um, and so and so, like right now, there's a lot of good opportunities. Um, and so, like you know, we are like. We're, we're being very active and we're working really hard. Um, and so, um, yeah, so I think, you know, hope that, that, that that's helpful to the audience here. So I, can mm -hmm. I give like a little example from, especially what Eric was talking about? So this mm -hmm. is what would happen um, a year, a year and a half ago. People would literally be like, you have 36 hours to do due diligence and we're, you know, you got to make a decision, you know, that's insanity. And people were in the biggest venture firms in the country were buying into that stuff. Um, uh, and that doesn't make any sense. Uh, that's not good. Uh, people are just throwing spaghetti at a wall trying to get in every deal they could possibly get in, and it's, it doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. Due diligence actually matters. Um, and so um, I just think, you know, now, um, you know, we can spend a couple weeks. Uh, we're, not, we're, not, we're not making irrational, um, emotional-based decisions. We're able to really uh, dig in, uh, get to know the, the, you know, the founder, and, and make sure that we're making making good decisions. I'm not suggesting I made decisions in 36 hours, but that was part of what was happening in the market um, in real life. That's what this stuff means, right? It's like, it's so hot that everybody yeah. wants to get in. As, as you read the FTX, some of the 
stories and some of the case studies coming out. That's some of some of that's pointed to its due diligence, and I, I know it's getting a spotlight again, rightfully so. So, yeah. um, completely agree with that. Uh, but moving on to our next topic on challenges and opportunity. I know we talked quite a bit about opportunities. You know, mostly if you're sitting on dry powder. Uh, I, I do want to kind of flip on the challenging side, which is, uh, and there is also a question on, on this topic about fundraising, especially. It's, uh, and, and I know some of you guys are um, fundraising or still looking. Um, so maybe Julia will, will stick with you and, and just, can you comment, is this, is this environment a challenging environment for fundraising? Uh, are allocators looking to go back into public equities, hold on to cash, or are they still working with you guys in terms of, you know, looking into privates? Well, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a different animal than uh, um, uh, I think our, my colleagues here that are on the call, because I, up until now, have only raised funds from uh, wealthy individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and so individuals, um, uh, and especially since I'm, a, you know, my fund is the mission-focused fund. We only fund companies founded by women. Um, uh, and, and so getting women in, in, especially during COVID, everybody wanted to be part of a solution that was bigger than themselves. And, um, they invested with us and they will make, they are making money and they will make money, but they basically said, listen, as long as I get my money back and be happy, I want to be part of something bigger than myself. And, um, so when you think about an environment like right now, and a lot of the women who've invested with us invested for the very first time, they'd never invested before. Um, and so, um, I think, I think for a lot of them, they look at their stock portfolio that's down, but a lot of them are, their income is just fine. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, saying, listen, it, it could be a moment for you to consider diversifying your portfolio. This could, it, it could be that moment to help you wake up and think about how you want to play differently. Um, and furthermore, when when you're having when there's a macro environment where you're feeling uh, down and depressed, sometimes someone who gives you some hope and a little bit of like um, sense of I'm being I'm part of something that's bigger than myself that's super powerful. Um, mm -hmm. Now we were going to start an institutional fundraise um, this uh, like in the last in the last couple months. I thought I would start in October, and we're holding off. Um, because when I talk to people, as I said earlier, you know, institutions are saying, listen, our portfolio needs to be rebalanced because of, you know, our overinvestment or um, because of the uh, constriction in the market. I need to make sure I keep investing and make sure my other uh, investments um, continue to get uh, my attention. And so um, I think it's probably, you know, raising money from institutions. If you don't already have a relationship where you're getting investment from them, it's probably not the best time to start trying to do that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but there could be some exceptions. I mean, in the kind of fundraising I do, um, a lot of it is mission kind of focused. And so you have, you know, big institutions coming out and saying, hey, listen, I just laid off 10% of my employees, but I'll put invest, I'll put money into something that feels good in, in, in the world and right. gets, you know, everybody thinking better of my company. So yeah, I'm, so, I'm a little and, bit of a bird in the kind of fundraising I do than these guys, I think. Interesting. Um, Eric, same question. I know we were having dinner a couple of days ago. And we were talking about uh, you working with family offices, and so what? what what's your um, current uh, pulse on on fundraising? Yeah. So about four or five weeks ago, I was in Vietnam, and uh, it was awesome. Uh, highly recommend. <laughs> but one of the things that you notice when you get to a country like that is the country is growing forty percent GDP year over year. Inflation is at two percent. And the moment that you land there, everyone is just optimistic. They're like, like we, this is our moment, you know? And it actually was a really good reminder that even though there might be some negative sentiment that we're sensing here in the United States, and it's maybe real, um, it's not universally shared necessarily in all markets of the world. So, um, you know, we have a lot of family offices, a couple institutions in our fund, but the thing that actually is different uh, maybe it's not so different anymore in venture, is that we have a pretty global bench of LPs who are backing us. Singapore is one place that I would really encourage people to really think about. Um, uh, Joe kind of hinted, hinted that there's like a cold war between China and the United States on the economic front. And uh, so it's making it very difficult for capital controls and trade to take place. And there are you know a lot of Chinese people probably that want to invest in the United States and vice versa. But uh, the way to get around that is to domicile your capital in Singapore, which is the economic Switzerland of the region. And they're also feeling really, really positive sentiment. So um, 
you know, for us, like when we do it with our fundraise, we, we want to really make sure that we had a global LP set. And, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of positivity and a lot of hunger if you, in certain kinds of markets, but you got to go there and take like the 17 hour flight. Right. <laughs> Joe, I know you've been globe prodding. Um, oh gosh, I've been everywhere. So you, you probably, yeah. Yeah. And any, uh, any other thoughts to add in terms of fundraising? Yeah, I completely agree with, um, Eric's comments and, Julie, um, and Julie's comments. So opportunities, I think, you know, we, we kind of touched on it. Like there's a lot of this, this is a great time to be investing at the point, um, into this sort of market correction. Um, and so, uh, um, so that's the opportunities, um, challenges for VCs is probably just helping the portfolio companies to survive this sort of reset. Um, and if you can, you know, there's going to be a, there's a washout, uh, a washout of mm -hmm. weak VCs, weak founders, weak employees. And this, uh, sorry, it's not kind of harsh, but you know, I, I've known a few, uh, other fund managers or funds who I've heard recently have said, Hey, maybe we are going to reconsider what I'm going to do. So you're, uh, you're already seeing that happening in my sort of world, uh, founders, companies, et cetera. So it's like helping companies and founders to get through this sort of, um, this sort of a, a reset, if you will. Um, and then obviously fundraising is tough, um, tougher in this environment for our asset class. Um, for me, uh, you know, I started in macro and I worked for, before I started millennia, I worked for a, a fund fund. Um, and so I, I did, I used to invest in funds. Uh, I looked at both venture and private credit and real estate and, you know, private equity. And, um, there's different calculus, the different, uh, LPs. So if you are like Julie kind of alluded to it, if you are a, let's say a pension and you, there's fixed out percentages that you're going to allocate to different strategies, private credit, private equity, et cetera. Well, now you have to probably shrink your private equity. Um, uh, because, uh, because you're going to get a higher return in CDs and cash, cash and CDs and treasuries and mortgage backed securities, like, which are considered lower risk, but the returns have kind of gone up to like five, six, seven, eight percent. Whereas in venture, it's very volatile. It's very long. And, um, and, and plus your in venture, you're not going to get any cash flow back. Whereas, whereas, whereas in real estate, in private credit, you're getting you know, cash flow back every year. So for a lot of investors, that's a really good feature. So, so like, um, so, so yeah. Um, and then for, for family offices, the different calculus for summer wealth funds is different calculus, but, but for, but overall for our asset class in venture capital, uh, in tech, it's, um, uh, it's, we're facing a lot of headwinds as an, I think as an, as an industry to raise capital from LPs for all, for the reason that our, our asset class is does really well when there's low rates and does really poorly when there's higher rates. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and there's, you know, I think there's challenges and opportunities, but, but having said that, like, you know, I think as a, as an entrepreneur, like I have to be level-headed and try to do the best I can, regardless of the macro environment. I can't control that. But what I can control is how I'm going to set a vision, how I'm going to strategize, how I'm going to work, how I'm going to, how I'm going to help our, our ecosystem. So for me, it's like, I'm still working as hard as, as before. Um, and I just know that like, you know, um, there's headwinds, but there's going to be tailwinds maybe in the next few years. Cool. Thanks, Joe. Um, all right, cool. I'm going to head into our next polling question. We're coming up to an hour here. Um, Amy, I'll turn it over to you for the third polling question. All right. Thank you. The third question, in your opinion, what would entrepreneurs mostly focus on heading into 2023 or what should they? A, cash management, B, expense reduction. C, growth and expansion, D, debt reduction, or E, other. And as a reminder, if you want to receive CPE for this particular session, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. Um, so we will have our fourth one coming up here before the end of the session. Yeah, in the interest of time, I mean, our next topic was going to talk, was going to touch upon your advice, um, all of your advice here entrepreneurs residing and are resident in your funds right now, Eric, I know you have quite a few, so maybe just what, what's, what's your advice to your entrepreneurs right now? Um, I guess like two things I talk a lot about, uh, and again, I don't want to bias the results as people are putting this in, but yeah, I think uh, cash management is like a, a very big topic for us just to make sure that you really understand 
uh, why you're making certain kinds of expenses and, you know, uh, are there any kind of like preemptive cuts that you can make for your own salaries or people's salaries or even like some teammates too that may not be working out for you to make those decisions sooner. So because while I think we're very active in deploying, like the thing that I get concerned about as a fund manager is like what happens in the next stage for downstream capital? Is that going to just get much, much harder? Are the metrics going to be far higher for, for people to unlock that? Um, and then the second is like, don't just try to block out the noise too, you know, like this stuff can get very, very distracting and it's easy to doom scroll at the end of the nights, like for hours, just saying like, oh my gosh, like the economy's going to collapse. And you know, a lot of this is out of our control. And I think like humans are pretty resilient. So just like focus on building your good stuff. That's it. Julie, any thoughts on, on your entrepreneurs? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, um, that Eric, you said it wisely, but I think, you know, if you can step back and just think, what are the opportunities in this environment for me? Uh, uh, right now with all these people who just got laid off, you know, one of the biggest things people have had was talent, ten, you know, 12 months ago. Well, I think all of a sudden your talent pool just got bigger. Um, uh, you know, it, and certainly, you know, we encourage people to think ahead and think, all right, well, for the last couple of years, we've avoided um, uh, consumer packaged good investments because of the supply chain problems. You know, what, what is, what's the environment, uh, what pressure is the environment going to put on, on whatever you're building? And let's make sure that you're cognizant of that. Um, and you either have contingencies for it, or um, you avoid that, that, you know, you pivot when, you know, Especially what Eric's doing is pivot time. Like every every day is a pivot. Um, so. Thanks, Julie. Joe, a any other thoughts on the, on this topic? I think just to reiterate, you know, Eric's point, my point is that you can't, as a, as a fund manager or, 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 or um, an entrepreneur, you can't control the macro. There's always things that, that's going to happen. Um, you, you, you know, you can only control what you can control, which is probably, um, you know, in this environment, just to execute. Um, you know, work with the, work with. The board, the VCs, and, and the senior employees, and like, you know, just ask for suggestions from people on the outside. Sometimes you're so like, you know, myself included. When you're sometimes you're so deep, you're focusing on your own world that you just need to talk to people on the outside to kind of get a perspective uh, and take a step back. Like, I mean, the slowdown we're heading into is not going to be a like, it's not going to be the, the end of the world. It's just going to be a, a reset. Um, okay. And so and so um, and so. But I think probably tactically, what's important is, uh, like Eric said, cash management. Is you just want to, because and cash management I think is important because you don't know when you, you don't know when the capital market is going to open up for growth, and even for early is actually more shielded but growth for growth. And even if they do op open up, you may not get a valuation you would like because you you know you raise your last round at a market bubble and now these values that collapsed so and you don't want to take a down round so you might just have to generate enough cash runway for yourself to grow into that valuation multiple so that you don't you know down rounds inventory is like a really thing that like can really get your investors like to be like oh my god so so a lot of founders are raising that as we're seeing but i think cash management is probably really important is like and i think you just want to you want to prep for worst case scenarios you want to prep that let's say the this recession lasts through 23 24 and maybe this you know, inflation doesn't go away. The Fed has to raise even more to 6%. Like, we don't know what's going to happen. But what you can control is, in the worst case scenario, can you survive? Can you do have enough cash runway for not just 12 to 18 months, maybe 18 to 24 months, maybe even 36 months? And if the, you know, if the market is kind of reopened, then you can kind of increase your burn a little bit more. And if the market stay, you know, kind of dry, you just kind of, you've got, you plan out two to three years of cash runway. So I think cash management is probably, in my opinion, the, the number one priority uh, going to next year. Well, and if I could just underscore something you said in the beginning, Joe, you have to you, you talk, don't hide your head in the sand when you're stressed, which we do as human beings, you know, um, and use your use the leverage and the value of your investors and ask for support and perspective or find outside somebody who doesn't have a, a stake in your business, but don't hide your head in the sand, I, which I don't know about you guys, I've done that in the past um, and it didn't serve me well. So uh, don't, don't get too insular. Yeah, and I was just add one thing is like, because we're like Julie's an entrepreneur, Eric's an entrepreneur, and I'm an entrepreneur. Like, we also kind of started our own businesses, our own visions. Like, we're very much in the same um, yeah. shoes. Like, we face the same insecurities, ups and downs, and like, yeah, you know, as the founders. And, and so, um, yeah, I want to I want to squeeze in one last polling question, and then we'll continue. Uh, we might go over a few minutes, but I have we can we can end this topic with cryptocurrency, right? I had to squeeze this in. So, 
uh, so Amy, turn it over to you quickly. All right, thank you. So the last question for this session is, what is your current outlook on cryptocurrency? A, bullish, B, bearish, C, flat, or D, none? All right, it's the hot potato, so who, whoever wants to take this? Uh, uh, Julie, I see you laughing, so I'm going to go with you. I, I, I'm not touching it with the 10-foot pole, because okay. I, I, so that's that's my answer. Okay. Eric, I know you may have dabbled into it, or? Yeah, we have 20 investments so. in uh, crypto-related companies, and I'm long-term bullish. I actually think right. that uh, we've seen three bull and bust cycles since 2017 alone. And they're rapid. So they, they collapse like mad and then they go up like crazy. But each time, this is going to sound kind of mean, like there's a bunch of like tourists and people that kind of turn this into like the speculative disaster. But each of these busts like kind of removes them and then leaves the true builders behind. And I just think that there's a real future behind decentralization. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like a really good evolution to where we are in the web and what could happen in the future. So um, it's really noisy in the near term, though. Um, Definitely, mm -hmm. like, I'm not trying to, like, do weird ARB strategies for certain crypto assets. Like, that's not my game. But long term, I think that, the you know, there's going to be a lot of credible people who continue to build here. So we have to follow where the great founders are. Might be some recency bias in this poll. Uh, <laughs> Joe, I, concluding thoughts on, on cryptocurrency. Yes. Or maybe, you know, I like to look at it as digital assets and cryptocurrency. It's two separate, like, a project yeah. and... and and maybe speculative currency. So maybe comment on both. Like it's yeah. um it it, it it feels like we're look, the 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 tech sector, the cloud, the cyber, the fintech is doing I mean is facing headwinds on both pri private and public, but they're here to survive. But um crypto, I think I mean blockchain crypto feels today feels like where the internet was in the one and the two. So I, but I think if you look at the internet, like if there was a huge washout with a few survivors, like Amazon, et cetera, like, you know, did really well after. So I think my guess is like within the crypto uh, blockchain enabled systems, like there, there's going to be a washout, um, but there will be a, a few winners that will survive and kind of come out of it. Um, and so like, I just, I wouldn't rule out the whole industry. Um, and so maybe it should be a small part of, an investor portfolio and just sort of see where it goes. And, and so that's usually, that's always been my, uh, my position, even going back to the peak last year was, you know, do a small party in this and see where it goes, but don't, 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 don't go all in or don't do anything. I think um, that's, so that's sort of my stance. Interesting. Well, I, that brings us to our conclusion. I, I wish we had, you know, another hour and we would have kept going. This is uh thank you so much for uh, all of you for bringing a, such an insightful, perspective i feel like i came in uh more bearish on the outlook just in, and now talking to you guys i, I feel like i'm coming out uh, i don't know what the rest of the audience feels like but that's that's personally my feeling i'm feeling much better so uh well thank you so much again julie eric joe i know you guys took the squeeze after the one hour for us and then all the preparation thank you so much for your time um and uh hopefully we'll, we'll continue chatting yep Thank you, guys. And I may, want to make a quick shout. Uh, we are very, very happy Moss Adams clients ourselves. Amazing Likewise. team to work with. Thanks for that yeah, opportunity. I love Moss Adams. Likewise. And All thanks right. so much, guys. That um, was not a plan, by the way. That, that was, that was, I did not Go Moss Adams. <laughs> yeah. No, send us Bitcoin for that side. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Th thank you all. Appreciate it. Ciao, guys. Um, Take care. So everyone else, we have a break, which is shortened by four minutes. So now it's uh, we'll, we'll reconvene at eleven ten. So keep your consoles on, and um, and then yeah, we'll be back at eleven ten.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. Our next session is a tax update. Our tax update will be divided into three sections. We'll have Jason talking about our general tax update, followed by Britain <coughs> providing an international tax update. And then we'll conclude the session with Chris talking about state and local tax updates. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jason. Thank you, Syed. Um, yeah, so so I, I think some of the tax matters have been covered previously a little bit by some of our other speakers, but we'll run through some of these things and um, hopefully some beneficial information for everyone. Again, my name is Jason Mon. I'm a tax partner here in the firm. Been in practice for over 26 years and uh, my practice practice is focused uh, predominantly on the taxation of private equity, venture capital, hedge, credit, and real estate funds. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so really today I'm going to focus on just two things, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which was signed into law back in August, and then just a, a quick uh, reminder on the qualified small business stock rules and some other considerations wrapped around those. So I think, um, but before we get into all that fun, I, I believe we're going to start with a polling question. Amy, is that is that the plan? Yes, Jason. So the first polling question for this session is do you think we will see a continued erosion of the carried interest benefits? A, yes, it is just a matter of time before it is all taxed at ordinary rate. B, yes, but at worst, they will just lengthen the holding period. Or C, no lobbyist in favor of historic carried interest rules will always win. And while you're responding, just a reminder that you do need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions in this session as well for uh, one CPE credit. Yes, thank you, Amy. So, so yeah, I'd be interested to see what people think here. Um, as we'll talk about, uh, there's been a couple of end runs at limiting the carried interest benefits starting back in 2017 and really le leading up the last couple of years. So. Uh, you know, to date, we've been able to mostly stiff arm the, the more uh, aggressive attempts to curb the benefits, but um, it seems to be something that Congress is focused on, so. And it looks like a lot of you tend to agree that the continued push towards uh, limiting the benefits is ultimately where, where we're gonna land here, unfortunately. Um, it is, of course, the carried interest rules are one of those things that are perceived as, as you know, the proverbial loophole in the tax code, and so it gets a lot of attention. So we will just have to see uh, how this all plays out. All right. So let's talk about the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, you know, this was, this was signed into law um, back in August of, of this year, so about four and a half months ago. And before we talk about the actual language in the signed bill, uh, really what I wanna focus on is more what was almost in the bill, because that's really the most important part for this group. Uh, as most of you know, and we just talked about a little bit, there were proposed changes to the carried interest rules. Um, however, in August 5th, these were dropped. There was a compromise with Senator Cinema in Arizona where those uh, provisions were dropped before things were finalized. So again, we sort of were able to avoid uh, potential further limitations on the carried interest rules. So let's look real quick as to what the bill did include before those uh, compromises were, were made on August 5th. Um, the, the key thing really is that, uh, you know, there, there were provisions that were going to expand the scope of Internal Co uh, Revenue Code Section 1061. And a lot of you are probably familiar that was included in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017 and was really the first uh, attempt at uh, curbing, if you will, the carried interest benefits uh, that were historically allowed by the code. Um, it's important to realize too, that the um, expansion of the 1061 rules that we saw preliminarily in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act were similar to the early Ways and Means Committee language that were included in the Build Back Better Act. Uh, of course, the BBBA was never signed into law in 21 and sort of led us to the path of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act here in 22. But you can, again, see that that has been really at the forefront of uh, congressional thought, if you will, 
as far as ways to be revenue raisers, honestly. So let's refresh on current 1061 guidance real quick. Um, as again, most of you know, we get long-term capital gain treatment on disposition of certain investments held for at least three years now. Again, that was new in 2017 or starting in 2018. The proposed change um, in the Inflation Reduction Act was moving that three-year period to a five-year holding period. And that might sound a little innocuous on the surface, not a good fact, but, but you, know, you might think, well, it's, you know, could be worse. Uh, you know, but the trick, the devil's in the details like everything else. And in those rules, there was a substantially all requirement, which effectively created the longer than five-year holding period. Uh, the rules said that the holding period begins on the later of the date that a taxpayer acquired substantially all of the partnership interests subject to 1061 or the date in which the partnership acquired substantially all of its assets. So you've got a layer of a specific investment or all of its assets. And, and you can probably start to see where that's problematic. Um, so what might happen is the date might begin at the end of the investment period, regardless of when you bought the investment. So like a private equity fund, a three-year investment period, uh, if you think about that, if everything sort of slides to the end of that three-year period, you're effectively looking at an eight-year potential hold before you get the capital gains benefits. So that's a big deal um, and, and, and would be uh, more problematic than it looks on the surface. So, all right, let's look at, let's talk about some other proposed changes uh, that didn't make the final bill. Again, these are things that were contemplated, but thankfully did not uh, hit the final signed bill. Um, currently, Section 1061 excludes certain types of gain from its scope. Uh, 12, Section 1231 gains, regulated future gains, mark to market under uh, Section 1256. There's a lot of other things that just aren't scoped into 1061 currently. Again, as originally drafted, those all would have been scoped in. So you can kind of continue to see we've got lengthening of holding periods, um, potentially other narrowing benefits or other narrowing ways to reduce the benefits uh, of, the, of the traditional carried interest provisions. Um, you would have seen the denial of long-term capital gain treatment on enterprise value. So there would have been just a lot of different ways where we would have gotten clipped on different things, um, including gain recognition provisions on the transfers of partnership interest and just a whole host of other potential um, problems, if you will, uh, when you're thinking about the benefits of the carried interest rules. What's the future hold? Well, that was you know the, the reason we had that polling question. Just kind of wanted to get everyone's thoughts. It seems like a lot of the folks here agree that at some point, uh, carried interest benefit is just going to go away. Um, but we will see. Uh, again, 2017 was the first time they sort of took a shot at it, sort of sat there for three or four years. And then the last two years, now we've seen attempts at further uh, uh, you know, narrowing of those benefits. So we will just continue to see if it crops up in other potential legislation in the future. All right, let's talk about some other tax impacts from the act real quick, which may affect more uh, in, at the portfolio company level, uh, but just things to be mindful of in general. 15% uh, alternative minimum tax on book profits, different than the old corporate AMT that some of you might be familiar with, but it's only applicable to those with over a billion dollars in profits over a three year uh, look back period. So it should be fairly narrow in scope. It's based on book earnings as defined under the under the rules, so a little um, less easy to manage than just say traditional taxable income. Um, a big one for public companies: one percent excess tax on stock buybacks. Um, that's that becomes effective here in, in 2023, so that's something to be mindful of. And of course, everyone hears about the 80, to 80 billion dollars for increased IRS funding. Um, you know, the question becomes: is well, what's the IRS going to use that money for? You can talk to some people who feel like they're seeing an uptick in, in um, uh, exam activity already. Uh, that is true. Uh, obviously, it's not necessarily the, the $80 billion kicking in quite yet. But the IRS is also a very outdated organization, ton of agents retiring. And so a lot of people think the $80 billion is going to go a lot towards replacing agents, not necessarily putting new agents in the field. Uh, as well as just updating systems and getting the um, IRS more current in how it functions. So we will see how that goes. And of course, um, the IRA Inflation Reduction Act also included numerous climate and clean energy credits and incentives, which uh, can, can be very beneficial and really kind of open up a lot of existing rules in that regard. All right, to keep things moving here, 
let's talk a little bit about um, qualified small business stock or QSBS, um, aka Section 1202 stock, as many of you know. Uh, quick overview, you know, why is this beneficial? I think most of you are aware of this. You know, there's a gain exclusion greater of 10 million or 10 times the adjusted basis of the investment. Significant upside there for, for paying no tax on qualified investments. Um, you know, when the stock was acquired drives the magnitude of this benefit. Uh, if you've got stocks that were acquired up to February 18th of 2009, it was a 50% exclusion. And then there's a window until September 20th of 2010 where it went to 75%. And anything thereafter is a 100% exclusion. Um, those earlier buckets, uh, the 50 and 75% uh, had AMT considerations you had to factor in because you could potentially have a benefit for regular tax purposes, but it was it was muted to some degree by the AMT implications. Uh, that doesn't exist with um, the 100% bucket. So really, we've had a long period now where we've had significant potential benefit. So, you know, as you look at your investments and you think about whether they're 1202 stock, um, you know, it's it's important to take do some legwork ahead of time to to measure that and understand if those are truly QSBS before you get to an exit event. And also be mindful that 1202 is not applicable at all state levels. Just like a lot of other federal rules, there may be um, a lack of conformity at the state level. And in, uh, for example, California is a big one where they do not align with the 1202 rules. So that can make a big difference as well. All right, um, let's see, I've got, yeah, I'm gonna go back, sorry, one more here. So the question then becomes, we've talked about carried interest and how long is that gonna last? Same question has to be raised with 1202. Um, it's been on the chopping block in recent years. I don't believe there was any language in the earlier iterations of the Inflation Reduction Act that looked to curb it, but the uh, Build Back Better Act was, was one place where they were specifically going to limit it. It would have eliminated the 75% and 100% benefit for taxpayers with adjusted gross income over 400 grand. So pretty low threshold there that would not get any benefit, uh, which if you think about it and the gains that you're potentially talking about, that, that might eliminate it for most folks. So we'll just have to see how this plays out. Again, uh, 1202 provides a ton of upside and it may just be something else along with the carried interest rules capital gains rates and a whole host of things that could be clipped at some point in the future as the service looks to uh, raise revenue. So uh, with that, I will hand it off to Britain for the international tax update. Thanks, Jason. Um, yep, as you said, my name's Britton Cunningham. I am a director in our international tax services group, and I'm gonna be giving the international tax update here really at the moment, I, I think we'll we'll focus the discussion on the Schedule K-2 because at the moment this is kind of where we are focused. Um, you know, we're seeing in the in the draft instructions for the 1065 for the year that the IRS is continuing to integrate the K-2 and K-3 in with the 1065. Um, they released draft instructions on October 25th, and then. Another set uh, last Friday, thank you very much. They always like to do that on Fridays for us. Uh, so we had a whole presentation for you, but we, uh, we had to modify it uh, for that update. Uh, but, but in those instructions, they detail new schedules. Uh, they add some helpful examples for how to complete the forms, uh, the schedules, um, and then they clarify a lot of like what they're expecting. Um, it's important to remember that you know, we had transition relief last year. It was the first year through notice 2021-39. Um, that no longer applies for this year. So we are all K2, K3 experts and expected to, uh, uh, that uh, we, can, we can prepare the form and no penalty relief is available. Um, what I wanna focus in on that uh, this hopefully relevant for, for a lot of you is you know, the, the alternatives in which a domestic only partnership could avoid, you know, filing a K2, K3 or providing the information to its partners. I mean, so this thing backing up has been a tremendous, tremendous amount of additional work for for us, uh, for you and in pulling together information to report to partners. Um, so, you know, if there's an option to not provide the information, especially if it's not needed, you know, we should we should be considering that. Unfortunately, uh, the 
exceptions remain very limited, but there are circumstances where it could apply. And so I think it's helpful to walk through this, you know, domestic filing exception. Um, so just a quick highlight, and then we'll go into the details. But, you know, there's there's generally there's four criteria to meet this domestic filing exception. We had something similar in 2021 that now in the draft um, you know, instructions has been, you know, clarified and has a lot more detail that we'll go through. Uh, but we still have kind of this four criteria. Um, and then the, the the new one uh, the new instructions incorporate partner notification requirements that are more specific uh, that we'll talk about um, and I think it leaves open the question of whether or not when you consider these new you know rules and procedures around notifying partners and receiving back notification from them as to whether or not it's just easier to prepare the K2 and K3s for all the partners. I think you have to consider that on a, you know, a return by return basis, um, certainly for like a simple partnership with just a few, you know, U.S. partners uh, into, that are individuals, maybe this makes sense. But when you get a lot of partnerships where you, I mean, partners where you might be getting a lot of, um, you know, answers back at different points in time, it could be more complex. So think about that as we talk about the requirement here and whether it makes sense. Um, an important date to remember that I'll talk about is the one month date. And this definition changed in the latest draft of the instructions. Um, so the one month date now, and these are draft instructions, so I suppose this could still change before we get final instructions, but the one month date is one month before the date the partnership actually files the form 1065. I think that's important and interesting given that, you know, it, 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 that's a much more uncertain date, the date the partnership's going to actually file the form than, say, putting it as the due date. So right there, you have some, you know, thought about whether or not the, you know, tracking feedback from partners, we'll talk about what that means, is going to be difficult to do after the fact, given that we don't know one month before what date exactly we may be filing the partnership return. But we, you know, if we're your your um, your uh, your firm, we'll need to be in close coordination with you for your partnership, you know, to 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 organize the times. So let's take a big step back, though, and just go to um, what we had last year as far as relief. And then I'll walk through how that lines with the new rule. So um, and this is, again, the domestic filing exception in limited circumstances it could apply. So. Um, last year, just looking at those sub bullets, um, we had four requirements. The direct partners of the partnership all must be non-foreign, cannot be foreign uh, partners. Uh, the partnership, the domestic partnership had to not have foreign activity. Um, in 2020, there was, a, there was a look back rule that said you had to look back to 2020 and there had to be, the partners had to be not requesting the information that would have been uh, provided with the you know, 2021 K3. And then finally, the partnership had to have no knowledge that the partners were requesting the information for um, 2021 tax year, which was the last filing year. So we're gonna do a little comparison here on the slides between what I just said, which is the 2021 requirements and what we have now in the draft instructions. So um, 2021 requirement, first one was no direct foreign partners. Well, in the instructions, uh, the 2022 requirement now lays out in detail what those direct partners have to be. So in essence, individuals that are US citizens or resident aliens um, and various types of entities through which an individual would potentially invest in a partnership, but ultimately for tax purposes, it's the individual who is taxable. Those are allowed and you would still meet the exception. Any other type of partner, it wouldn't. So if the partnership you're filing a return for uh, has one corporate partner or one partnership as a partner, then that's it. This exception would not apply. OK, you would not meet this first criteria. So that's how that would work. So moving on to the next criterion. Um, there has to, had to be no foreign activity last year. Well, we got a little bit of help there, but it's not a lot. So 
Now we have limited foreign activity, and they did provide a little bit of room on that, uh, but not much. So the, the activity has to be a passive category that there wasn't more than 300 of foreign income taxes that are going to be claimed as a credit, and um, the income taxes have to be shown on a payee statement. They can't just be income taxes that the partnership is you know, operating a branch and then calculating and reporting the taxes paid. So that's a pretty high threshold and probably, you know, if you have any foreign activity, uh, you might not meet that. But of course, for partnerships that have no foreign activity, you know, then this, uh, this could certainly make sense. So if you meet that, those two, um, then you would go on to third and fourth. Now, last year, looking at the last row here, we had that look back requirement to the prior tax year as to whether or not the partnership provided the information to the partners or the information was needed, this foreign information. There is no look back rule under the draft instructions for the 2022 tax year, this fi next filing season. So that's good news. But if you read the instructions closely, it looks like they're gonna be adding one back in for 2023. So we're gonna have to be very close and mindful, mindful uh, and keeping close track of which partners did and didn't need this information. And that'll become more, uh, you know, you'll see why in a minute. So going here to the next slide, um, in 2021, we had that last requirement that the partnership had to have no knowledge that the partners were requesting the information for the uh, tax year 2021. That's the top left here of the slide. Um, and then there was, you know, were requirements generally around if the partnership information was requested. So um, this year, that's where we're going to spend a little time talking because these notification requirements have been very closely specified. So for 2022, uh, for, for partner, as long as the partnership satisfy the first two criteria, the third one would be that the partnership has to notify its partners that the partner will not receive a K-3 from the partnership unless the partners request the schedule. So this notification uh, has to be provided at the latest when the partnership furnishes the K-1 to the partner, and it can be included as an attachment to the Schedule K-1. This is actually a little bit of relief because the first draft of the instructions we're having you notify partners, you know, in February. And, and so that that's really relieved a little bit there, which is, which is good news. The fourth criteria involve provides that the partnership has to not receive a request. This is important to listen to has to not receive a request from any partner for the K3 information on or before the one month date. And remember that was the date that is one month before the uh, Form 1065 is filed. So the last possible date that could be would be uh, August 15th, 2023 for a calendar year partnership uh, because September 15th is the filing deadline. Um, but it's the one month date before the partnership return is filed, not the filing deadline. So, so those are the requirements, but I'm gonna move to the next slide here and give you a couple of scenarios to walk through and then we'll do some examples because there's, there's some relief hidden in here as long as you meet the first three criteria, but it's up to you to decide whether or not you think it's actually going to be helpful under your specific facts, okay? So let's start with the first scenario. And in both of these, we're assuming that criteria one, two, and three are met, right? Um, so on criteria, so that, that you don't have any foreign partners, no foreign activity or limited foreign activity, and you have notified the partners. As long as you did all that, then you're just waiting to find out, did the partners request the information? So in scenario one, the partnership does not receive any request from a partner on or before the one month date, okay? But they do receive a request from a partner after the one month date. If that happens, then the partnership would not be required to file the 2022 K2 and K3 with the IRS. Uh, the partnership would not be required to refurnish the tax year 22 K3 to the non-requesting partners, um, the, but the partnership must provide the K3 completed with the requested info to the requesting partner on the later of the date on which the partnership files the 1065 
or one month from the date on which the partnership receives a request. And we'll go through an example of that in a minute. So there's this one month period and, and the partnership has to provide that information to that partner. Um, and then, you know, otherwise does not have to file the K2 and K3 with the IRS. So that, that's important info. The, here's the look back requirement for 2023. This is the fourth bullet point in the top section there. The partnership must complete and file the 2023 K2 and K3 for uh, with respect to the requesting partner by the tax year 2023 form 1065 filing deadline. So for any partners that request this information this year, we're going to have to be tracking that. And then we will have to pro provide that information with the return in 2023. So there's going to be a look back requirement next year. Okay. So going to scenario two, in this case, the partnership does receive a request from a partner on or before the one month date. So in that case, um, they met all of the first three criteria, but they did not meet criteria four. Um, if that happens, then the partnership is required to file the tax year 2022 K2 and K3 with the IRS. They need to, re um, the, they have to furnish the tax year 2022 K3 to that requesting partner um, by the date that the form is filed with the IRS, which makes sense. But but here's the good news. The, the K2 and K3 are required to be completed only with respect to the parts and sections that are relevant to that requesting partner. So it could still save you some time. It's possible, but it depends. And it's going to depend on how many partners you're having to, to figure out whether they did or didn't respond by this one month date. Um, and, and, and then there's the, the fourth bullet says, you know, the partnership does not need to complete, attach, file, or furnish any other parts of the K2 and K3 to, with the IRS. That's straight out of the instructions. And we'll do an example of that in example three. Um, you know, again, partnership's going to need to keep records because in 2023, uh, this information is going to need to be reported. Um, the last note down there just talks about, you know, the fact that you're going to be receiving requests before and after the date possibly from multiple partners. So what do you do if you get some from one, but, but not from the others? Well, you follow the same scenarios with respect to each type of partner, whether they've responded before or after the date. And that that's how that would work. But you're still, if you meet the first three criteria, potentially out of needing to provide information to any partners that don't request the information. So let's do some examples from the instructions real quick. Hopefully we're still good on time. This, this is a pretty simple example, um, it, but, but you know, following on with these facts for the next two. So you've got a husband and wife, there's US citizens, each own 50% of USP, a domestic partnership, which uh, invests in a regulated investment company that provides a 1099 showing that 100 of creditable foreign taxes were paid. So there's a payee statement, you've got the, the foreign in income, the foreign activity is not above the threshold, so they meet one through three, it, because on the third bullet point, they receive notica notification from USP that on the K-1 that they will they will not receive the K-3 unless requested. So if they don't request it at any point in time, then USP qualifies for criteria four and no K-2 and K-3 need to be prepared or filed with the IRS. So under the second example, um, H, we still have H&W, but in this case, they each own 40%, and there's a new partner here, partner A, who's also a U.S. citizen, who owns 20%. So in this case, case A does request a K-3 from the U.S. partnership for tax year 2022, and the partnership receives the request by February 1st, 2023, and then USP extends and then files the return on uh, – August 31, 2023. So what's the one month date? It's July 31, one month before the, the form was actually filed. In this case, um, the partner A has requested the information um, before the one month date. And so USP would not qualify for the domestic filing exception uh, because that information was requested before the date. But and so what will USP need to do? Well, they will need to complete and file with the IRS the parts and sections of the K2 and K3 that are relevant to A and provide a copy 
of the K-3-2A on the date that the form is filed. Um, but they would not need to complete, attach, or file any parts or sections relevant to husband and wife with the IRS, nor would they need to furnish a K-3 to H and W. So this is, is still potentially helpful, even though USP doesn't meet the last criteria because someone requested the info. Um, last example, and I meant to say these examples line up with the example numbers from the instructions. So we're on the third example, but this is the example four from the instructions in case you want to cross-reference. Um, in this, is the facts are the same, except that A requests the K-3 from the U.S. Uh, partnership um, uh, and the partnership re receives the request after the one month date. OK, so after July 31st, 2023, on August 20, they received the request. In this case, because it's after the one month date, USP would qualify for the exception um, um, because it's after the one month date. But and so USP is not required to file the 2022 K3 and, and K2 with the IRS or furnish the information to H&W. However, a USP would be required to provide the K3 um, completed with the requested information to A on September 20th, which is the later of the date on which they, the form was filed or one month from the date it was requested. And then remember that next year, we're gonna have to look back to this year and know that someone requested this information and that information is going to need to be included in the return and filed. So a lot of this just goes to, we're gonna have a lot of communication back and forth between the person preparing the return, the partnership and partners. And we're gonna need to keep this in, you know, information if we want to meet this domestic filing exception. If we file the K2 and K3 and we don't try to meet the exception, None of this would be relevant. There is one other exception I want to highlight here, um, but I think it's a limited exception. Um, this is the Form 1116 exemption exception, and I didn't double up. That's exactly how it's written in the instructions. So there is an exemption for individuals uh, that they would not need to file a Form 116 to claim a foreign tax credit in certain circumstances. And in the interest of time, I won't read through all this, but it's very close to the, the requirements for the foreign activity um, that, that we had with this domestic filing exception. But if you are notified by, part, by your partners who are individuals that they are not required to file the Form 1116 because they've made this election to do this, then the partnership would not need to provide that information, the K2 and K3 are filed that with the IRS. Um, but it's, if the partnership receives notification from only one, only some of the partners that they're eligible, uh, then the par partnership doesn't need to complete the K-3 for those exempt partners, but they would have to complete the K-2 and K-3 with respect to the other partners to the extent the partnership does not qualify for the domestic filing exception, the other exception. So, you know, the, there's a lot of communication needed. So. All right, um, we're getting towards the end of this section. Just wanna highlight on this slide that in the draft instructions, the, the IRS makes a point of clarifying that there are limited circumstances in which even a domestic partnership with no foreign activity, no foreign partners would need to, uh, would be able to be, not need to file it. The, the information still may be needed for the partners because purely domestic information could be relevant for those partners in preparing their, their tax returns. So um, they provide examples throughout the instructions showing how and why this may still be needed. So basically prepare to prepare the K2 and K3 with the return. Um, just quick highlights of some other changes because uh, they're throughout the instructions. Um, Continuing the instructions do not address situations in which the partnership knows that information isn't relevant. Um, so again, we reporting would still be required unless one of the exceptions applies. The partnership has to presume that uh, the information is needed unless they hear otherwise from from partners. Um, part one, box one, if capital gain reporting, if you're doing a lot of capital gain reporting, we no longer have to report the proceeds and basis. 
uh, just the gain can be reported and whether it is short or long term. Um, and also the partnership could now combine stock sales by country, but we still have country by country reporting, although they have added a new country code XX, which can be used when we don't have a country code or don't know what the country is, but I would only use that if you, you know, not able to find the country. Um, we got clarification on R&E and interest expense apportionment, which is very, very much needed, as well as uh, they added a, sec a, a new section for the stewardship expense apportionment, which we'll have to deal with this year. They added a lot of clarification on PFIX, so that's great news uh, in part seven. Um, and then, like I said, throughout the instructions, more clarifications and examples. And last, I think we have a polling question, and that's it for my session. All right, thank you. So the second polling question is, do you think the new domestic filing exception will reduce the K-2, K-3 work, or do you think the partnership notification requirements negate the benefit of the exception? A, will not apply to my partnership. B, more trouble than it's worth. C, may reduce the work of some partnerships. Or D, will be very helpful. And you do have the option to submit questions for the presenters in the Q&A window. Uh, we do have quite a bit of content to cover today, so if we don't have time to respond uh, during the conference, we'll do our best to follow up with you afterwards. Yeah, interesting to see the results here. More trouble than it's worth seems to take the day, um, but may, that's kind of what I expected to see. But um, um, I think I'll hand it off to Chris for his session, and I will try to answer the question here in the Q&A uh, separately. Thanks, Braden. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Uh, talk a little bit about state and local taxes for a few minutes here, and then let you get on to lunch. <clears throat> I think we're starting with a polling question. All right, so the third question for this session is, where are you thinking about moving your residence? A, nowhere, staying put for now. B, zero income state, uh, tax state like Wyoming or Washington. C, lower business tax state like Tennessee or Texas. D, foreign country, or E, not sure yet, but thinking about options. And all of these options are questions clients have raised to us as they've been thinking, looking ahead and thinking about transitioning. Some people decide after thinking through what a transition might look like that they wanna stay put. Others want to change their state tax implications and move to a lower income tax state and others still uh, are looking abroad. Um, we're getting a lot of interest in Europe, Puerto Rico, uh, so it, all over the map. So it was curious to get some a pulse on the, the audience here. Stay in put for now. All right, well, that's a good way, good way to go. So, just briefly, because we do get so many residency transition questions, uh, wanted to just kind of talk about thinking if you are going to consider a residency transition, what that would look like, and you know some of the considerations that you may want. And the reason that people are asking the question is because what we're starting to see at the state tax level is states both increasing their taxes overall and then getting more aggressive about tax collection particularly if we are moving into a recessionary phase, what we're going to see is the state revenue authorities really turning up the dial on bringing in revenue. And one of the ways they do that is through enhanced audit activity. Uh, so some of the considerations you might wanna think about if you are considering a transition, whether that's a, a large transaction or a residency transition, or, or just kind of the high level timing and you know, giving yourself lots of time to plan an upcoming transition or transaction, giving yourself lots of uh, coordination with your tax identification, entity identification, and thinking through how the, the long-term ramifications of that. And 
one of the considerations that comes up frequently is how long do I have to stay? If I do want to get out of my current state, how long do I have to stay? And, and the answer is at least four years. Um, if you're going to think about going back to a prior state, uh, you need to consider that as part of your residency analysis. If you are comfortable being in the new state, that's going to be important. Family is always a, a consideration. And then thinking through what the uh, audit might look like if you were going to be picked up for a residency audit, because this is something that a lot of states are exploring as additional activity. We have the new capital gains tax coming in on the state of Washington, likely. Uh, it, the Supreme Court there is going to be having a hearing on January 26th to evaluate whether or not the capital gains tax will be effective. If it is, the question that remains outstanding is, is it going to be retroactive to enactment, retroactive to January 1st of this year, which was when it was supposed to take effect, or will it just be prospective? That would be a 7% capital gains rate going forward. And so that question about moving suddenly becomes more interesting for those folks who have been in Washington and now say, I don't really want to be subject to a 7% capital gains tax and want to, to think about transitioning out. If you are, if you do transition and you are subject to a residency audit, just keep in mind, they are very intimate. They're going to ask you very personal questions about your lifestyle, where you spend your time, where you go to the doctor, where you go to the dentist, where you go to social activities, gyms. Uh, very detailed, long, and going through that preparation matters. If you're thinking about transitioning your business, which is also coming up a lot for our, our state tax analysis, some of the other considerations that may come in are where moving the principles of the business does not mean moving the business. The questions on where are the operations of the entity, where are the investors, and where is the management? One of the reasons the investors become important and something for you to consider is that a lot of states are transitioning from what was called cost of performance, which is where was the activity, where was the cost center of the activity, to market-based sourcing, which is where is the market that is supporting this business. And in the investment community, that is your investors. So if you have all of your investors in the state of California even if you move the overall operation of the fund to another state, California is going to say, we still get all of it because your investors, the market for your business is here in California. And so thinking, if you are thinking about transitioning your business, thinking about trying to reduce your exposure to state tax, depending on which state you're looking at, one of the challenges may be that you really need to think not just about moving the principles and maybe re- organizing you know, from California to Delaware, for example, you also may need to think through the investment relationships, management relationships that are in the current business. <clears throat> the, as more states are changing, but not all the states have adopted the same methodology, it also creates a consternation because if you have activity in multiple states, you now could have different state regimes trying to tax the exact same dollar through each state's method. So one state may say, hey, because the operation is here, we get to tax it. Another state like California may say, we don't care where the operation is, we care where the investors are. Since your investors are in California, we get to tax it. This is just becoming a more complex web that we have to work through with clients, particularly clients that are growing and expanding their operations, expanding their investments, and expanding their investors into multiple states. So the more proactive uh, you could be about the your, your situation and being thoughtful and, and looking ahead uh, as you're thinking about your, your reporting requirements, it's just becoming more and more important to do this in advance. And then the question becomes, well, what about, what if I don't really want to be in the States anymore? What about Puerto Rico or what about something looking abroad? And, and then we get right back into Britain's conversation about the K2 and K3. We also get into conversations about foreign reporting rules versus U.S. domestic reporting rules. A number of the rules and restrictions are very stringent. Reporting issues become even more complicated. And residency transitions to a foreign jurisdiction are often lead are often significantly more complicated if you are thinking about moving there. Um, one of the examples that comes up frequently is questions about Puerto Rico 
because they are still a U.S. territory. Uh, but before we get to that, let's ask the question, are you considering moving your business? And Amy, I'll let you take it over from there. All right, thank you. So yes, this is the last polling question um, of our conference. So are you considering moving your business? A, yes, happening now. B, yes, in the next year or so. C, maybe haven't decided yet. D, no, find where we're at. Or E, recently moved and going well so far. And while you're responding to that, I do want to make you aware of a survey that we have set up uh, for you to provide feedback for today's session. You can find that linked in the slide deck and handouts window in your console. We'll leave this up another five seconds or so to make sure everyone gets their CPE. Sure. All right, here you go. Find where we're at, great. So one, one more uh, item just to mention as we're closing out on time here, didn't make it into the slides is the pastor entity tax election, which is becoming a, a bigger issue for a number of our clients as more states adopt pastor entity tax election. Here too, the challenge with the states is each state has adopted their own regime and they're not all, in fact, none of them are the same. So right now we have uh, 29 states plus the District of Columbia that have adopted various pastor entity tax regimes. Each of them have different reporting requirements. Each of them have different outcomes in terms of some states allow you to just roll it forward. Some states allow you to get a refund, like Oregon. Uh, so if you are thinking about participating in a pastor entity tax election, make sure that A, your entity is eligible. It's usually going to be for an S corporation or an LLC. Uh, your C corporations are not eligible. Then make sure that your shareholders are eligible. And then the question, and this is where, depending on which state you're in, becomes a bigger question, is what are the requirements for shareholder participation? So for example, California allows you to have a shareholder by shareholder question about whether or not they would like to participate in the pastor entity tax. Other states require all the shareholders to be the same and either it's uniform yes or uniform no. If you have an S corporation that has multiple shareholders, you also run into the federal issue of whether or not you are creating a second class of stock if you have some shareholders who want to participate and some shareholders who do not. Um, so just in the interest of time, we didn't put this in the slides because it really could be its own conversation or a number of presentations out there about the pastor entity tax. If it's something that you have some interest in, please don't hesitate to let us know or we can direct you to one of the other presentations on the issue. With that, given that we've got about, uh, what, seven minutes left, there are any questions? And Britton, I know there's one question for you if you wanna chime in on that first. I think I already answered that question. It was just whether, the, you know, an individual had requested, uh, you know, that they did, said that they didn't need the information, I believe in, the, you know, this year, but, you know, would what would the procedure be? And I would just recommend following the same procedure notify all the partners and then you know if you don't hear back from them you follow the same process um so that was the answer on that one okay great and one of the other questions that came in is about remote work and so this is an issue that's that's driving a lot of state tax questions for us right now and the remote work issues usually fall into two buckets bucket number one is we've got a remote employee that we didn't necessarily know was remote before, but now we've, we found out that this employee is working in another state. What does that mean? What does that mean for our business? What does that mean for the employee? Uh, at a high level, there are some considerations for income tax and sales tax by having an employee in another state, because most states have a still have what's called the physical presence nexus standard, which is to say that if you have an employee in, in that state, you have physical presence in that state. And that physical presence requires a filing obligation. Uh, it would also typically require registration with the Secretary of State in that other location. 
So you, you want to be thoughtful about that. Um, depending on the other state that the person may be working in, there are in a number of states now very unique rules on health care, very unique rules on paid family leave. Uh, we have the state of Washington that has the long-term care requirement. So you're going to want to think through once you have employees in other states, whether or not there are unique applications that you need to be thoughtful about with regards to that employee. By the same token, if you are think, uh, thinking about hiring in other states, be very cautious about the other states' requirements for position postings. A number of states are starting to require that salary and the entire range of salary for that position be disclosed so that the person who is applying can understand the potential range of salary. Again, there are other requirements that depending on which state we're talking about, so just be mindful of that. From the other side is, uh, you know, you've got a principal now that's working in a low tax state like Nevada or Wyoming or Texas, but the business is still in California or Oregon, one of the higher tax states. <clears throat> now you've still got the same issue. You've, you've typically got a compensated employee who's also maybe receiving a K-1. So you may have reporting obligations for the business in the new state because you've now got a principal there. <coughs> Excuse me. You'll have S Secretary of State registration issues, and then you're going to have to do some sort of income apportionment to be, you know, make sure that the income tax items are properly reported. And then long term, the question is going to be what happens with the partnership items and capital gains items as you're getting looking at carried interest and looking at some of the application. That's the Franchise Tax Board, particularly for the state of California, has basically said, we think that the sourcing uh, is still going to follow that investor rule which means that you may not see the benefit by moving to another state that you would um, be in the, the prior cost performance regime. So looking again at the states and where they're, how they're applying their sourcing rules is really gonna be important. Um, one of the questions, uh, yeah, we can, we can send a link on the pasture entity tax collection or provide, I think it's on our website at mossadams.com if you type in past serenity tax i think you can get to one of the presentations but we can also excuse me we can also send you a link to to that jason or syed other questions that no i don't see any other questions coming in chris um so if, if anyone does uh, they can definitely reach out to you right chris um absolutely or anyone on the panel and um so yeah okay but with that again i would like to thank chris Britton, jason that thank you for that text update and there's a lot of changes going on each year so appreciate you guys coming in and providing that insight uh for some additional resources we have quite a few articles um that we publish most of you should be on our mailing list and should be getting these um, as they come out. So please check them out. They're also on our website. Uh, the links are in the presentation. The presentations all will be uh, provided to you after um, the, the session today, uh, maybe tomorrow. So please keep an eye out for that. There will be a replay available for both days um, that will also be provided to you via a link coming to your email. Uh, with that said, this, this concludes our 2022 uh, conference. I would like to thank all of our speakers, uh, presenters from both today and yesterday. Uh, hopefully you guys found our um, conference and the sessions we covered insightful. Uh, would love to get your feedback. There will be a link provided to you. Oh, here, here's a link on the screen. Uh, so please let us know how we can improve uh, going forward. Uh, one thing we're also asking is whether you guys prefer a conference to be in person or hybrid or continue to be in a virtual format. So please uh, provide us any feedback there. And with that said, thank you so much. Um, have a great rest of the day and we will see you soon next year, hopefully. Thank you all. <laughs>